<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so, uh, Paul uh, and Catherine asked me to, um, uh, I think it started when we were at, uh, on a flyway at Cromer, actually. People kept asking me about things, and I kept kind of all these stories. And Paul said, uh, we, should, we should get you somewhere that you can tell all these stories. So I think that's where uh, this came from. Um, so um, what I thought I'd do is probably spend about 30 minutes with a bunch of stories over my last 40 years of flying. And then probably open it up for questions because it's always a bit more interesting with questions and I always find it more interesting anyway because I've heard all the stories before. <laughs> so um, the first... Uh, okay. And I can't move, move the slides. Yeah, just try and space pass it. No. Or no, try another key. There we go. There we go. Which one was that? That was the main uh, one. Yeah, I'll just mouse. Because I put the mouse on the screen. So okay. So... Um, First story then, um, and probably uh, the one that if anyone identified, asked me to tell, me, tell a story about flying a Chinook is the one I would start with. So it's Gulf War One. it's 1991. Everyone still old enough in the room? No, the people shaking up, 1991. Anyway, there was a war in 1991 uh, after Saddam invaded Kuwait um, and uh, most of the Western world mobilized to try and eject him from Kuwait. Uh, at that point, um, I was on number seven squadron I was on the Special Forces Chinook flight of number seven squadron. Uh, and there were five Special Forces crews of which I was the captain of one of them. I was the youngest one. Uh, uh, and I'll come back to my career chronology uh, after this slide. So I was 25 years old. Um, we deployed to Abu Dhabi in the Emirates to start working up with the SAS and the SBS. Uh, and just after Christmas, I think it was been Christmas and New Year of 1990, Squadron Commander got all five mission captains in and sat us in different rooms and gave us a mission appraisal to do. Uh, and the mission was to, um, you, bet, you better admit that one, haven't you? Why have you been in trouble? It's the boss. Yeah. And the mission was, uh, could you uh, get a pair of Chinooks um, into the outskirts of Baghdad uh, to a certain grid location, uh, drop off some people and then come back out again. And I was the last one to go and give the debrief. The other four said, no, you're mad, you get blown out of the sky before you get even. And I was just kind of, I think, a bit naive and a bit curious. So I spent hours with nomographs and radio cross sections. And, and I said, well, if you come in from the north where they're not expecting you to do this and you do that, uh, you'll get in, but we won't get out. So it's a one-way mission. And went, Okay. And I thought nothing more of it. I thought it was just an interesting exercise to do one Saturday afternoon in the middle of the desert. Um, on the 22nd of January uh, 1991, so the war was about six days old at the time, uh, and I'd already flown one, one mission. Um, you've all read Bravo 2-0? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I inserted Bravo 2-1. They were the patrol that didn't get bumped. Um, so I'd, I'd already done that that job um the night before or two nights before uh and my boss called me in and said sean um you know that mission appraisal that i asked you to do I said yeah yeah tomorrow night and i went no hang on a minute i said we'd only get in we wouldn't get out i said it's that important and you're going with your number two um uh, we normally flew in pairs and ian mcfarland i kind of briefed him a little bit on it because of but of all, because of operational security we were not allowed to tell anybody else what we're doing because we got shot down and started being interrogated um then uh, you could start giving away um what other people are up to which would be dangerous for them so uh and what has happened uh, and, and the target uh saddam had been uh firing scuds at um uh all around the middle east and then he decided to fire them at tel aviv uh and i think six hit and i don't know whether people have been killed as well i can't remember that one yeah. my memory is a bit a bit hazy um and we knew that uh, there was a fragile point, there was a vulnerable point, which was a fiber optic node. Because to fire these things, you have to uh, give high level met information so that they'll go. And also all of the data, because um, the SCUDs were operated in a, in a very centralized um, Soviet Russian way, um, that they couldn't be fired unless all of the codes and everything else came through. And these were being passed through fiber optics. Uh, and uh, the fiber optic node was just on, you know, so imagine Baghdad's got an M25 around it, and it was about five miles inside the M25. 
So uh, um, we tried to bomb it, uh, but of course, trying to bomb through sand is quite difficult. Um, these these fiber optics, and you had to hit the nodal point quite accurately. And and the uh, they were about seven eight feet uh, inside. And, and they, there's a reason why you put sandbags around things because they just absorb the shock. Um, we knew where the board was because the French, bless them, had laid it for them a few years beforehand. Uh, and the deal was is that we had uh, um, that night to go and rehearse it. And what we were going to do was land next to um, the marker board, pull the marker board out. Uh, the SBS would then dig two holes, two trenches, some foot down, cut um, the fiber optic 10 meters apart and then pull it out. And then very difficult to join it back up again. Uh, originally, I was going to drop them uh, and then come back for them the next night. And I said, well, we're not going to come back because we're going to, going to get shot now. There was another option that we would drop them and do something like the Falcons War. We'd take the aircraft a um, couple of kilometers away, uh, get out of them and then blow the aircraft up uh, and, then, and then try and walk out with the SPS. I didn't fancy that. Um, so I, I said to the troop commander, I said, um, I said, I didn't think we'd get out, but we've still got a chance of coming out. He said, no, I'm with you. I think if, um, if we're on the ground running away from that, the chances of us getting um, tapped up are pretty high. So we convinced the system then to give us the chance to, um, to both go in and, and fly out. But what I had to do was brief my crew and the other crew that we were going to do this because they knew nothing about it. So with my crew, I had uh, three load masters, uh, another pilot, and same with the other crew. And I still remember, I'm 25 years old, standing in a room, all black, all the curtains all black out. Reveal the maps and gentlemen um, to one night, we're going there. And they all looked at me and went, <laughs> yeah, Sean, yeah. That's in what was known as the Baghdad Supermes, the super missile engagement zone. The only thing that could get inside those things at the moment was cruise missiles and stealth fighters. Uh, so, uh, My pitch was, um, you know, we are special forces. This is a tactical action for strategic effect. The Israelis said, if you don't do it, we'll do it. And they gave us 24 hours to do it. And if Israel had entered the war, then the coalition would have fractured. Um, and you'd all be paying 50 pounds a gallon for fuel because all those oil fields would have gone. And the geopolitics of the Middle East would have been probably changed in the next 20 years. So I said, um, that's the reason we're going to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I looked at them all um, and I said, here's the plan. And they were quizzical. And at the end of it, I said, any questions? And I thought, here we go. And one of them, one of them just said, excuse me, let's just do it, shall we? Uh, so we did it. Um, but, I, but you know, there's me, a 25 year old. There were guys in their mid thirties with kids. I was single with no kids, you know, and, and they all knew exactly what I thought. The chance of coming back from this is probably less than 20%. So um, what else do I remember uh, about that night? I remember uh, that if you were on ops that night, you got fresh food. Otherwise, you're on baked beans and ration packs. So we actually got fresh food. I think we had bacon and eggs. I also remember that what we would do is we would get changed out of our uh, normal gear and put on our combat gear, which was completely sanitized, no names, no ranks, no nothing. Uh, and you'd leave everything else behind. Um, we were all given um, 20 gold sovereigns to try and buy our way out if we ever got lifted. We all realized that'd be a really good reason to kill you. <laughs> so we just put a big pile of Twenty gold sovereigns on the, on my camp cot said, "If we don't, we but left a note. If we don't come back, have a great party." <laughs> um, I also then remember um, uh, us having waiting to go across the other side of the airfield, and you can see there that was um, a painting that was done uh, commissioned by the Special Boat Service. Um, the guy in the middle of the picture with his hands on his pocket, slouching with his rifle over his shoulder, is me apparently having a chat with the troop commander before we got into um, into the aircraft. I remember us getting in that Unimog, uh, and it was actually the, the guys were playing frisbee, and I said, gentlemen, time to go. And it was a bit like, you know, I felt like a bit like Dan Busters, you know, we're playing cricket outside the hangar, and I went, time to go. So we all climbed onto the Unimog, and uh, uh, we dropped all the, uh, the crews off at the aircraft. Um, the troops were there already um, with all of, all of the high explosive that they're going to blow this stuff up with. And they had a special little machine that the French had given that you could detect fiber optic kind of boil that round and you could actually detect fiber optics in the sound. So that's how they're going to find it. Um, and myself and Ian, who's the other captain, um, were dropped off in a in like a little hut on the side of this desert airfield, a place called Al Juf, about 60 miles away from the uh, the Iraqi border. Um, and it's 
So the most freaky thing that happened all night, as I walked in uh, to sign for the aircraft, to sign the tech log, mm -hmm. 30 engineers all stood up and came to attention. I thought, and what had happened? We had, uh, during the day, gone in and put uh, the whole the route into the flight management computers and checked in, of course, what they'd done. So they'd gone on the map and put, found out where we were going. And they didn't think we were coming back either. Mm. That was the most freaky thing of the whole night, is having 25 RAF technicians all stand to attention. I've never had that happen before. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever had that since. Even, nice even as a three-star, I don't think I've ever had that happen. Um, so we then went out to the aircraft and actually quite nervous, right until the point where I put the battery on. Uh, and we all checked in on the intercom, and then it was just another trip. Training just kicked in. Um, I remember us getting everyone just as it was getting dark, we're on night vision goggles. Um, and uh, the other thing we would do is with about 20 miles trying to the border, we'd, um, we'd fire the weapons. I've got a video later, which you'll see actually of Afghanistan, uh, with the M1. We had uh, two M134 miniguns that we'd procured. These things fire 5,000 rounds a minute of 7.6 to armor piercing ammunition. So it, it quiet. So we'd fire these things as we were kind of descending down to low level. Big sheets of flame come outside of the aircraft. And you'd fire it far enough away from the border that people wouldn't be seeing it coming. And then I, uh, for the second time, because we'd done it two nights before, I remember Robbie, as my co pilot, said uh, uh, two miles to run to enemy territory. And that's quite a freaky thing to do, actually, two miles. I said, we're in enemy territory. And uh, we were flying at, um, and this is probably more I regret, we were flying at 30 feet and 140 knots at night. So anyone who thinks navigation is difficult, mm -hmm. uh, 1,500 feet, <laughs> mind you, the only thing I navigate also was GPS, because it's, it's like navigating on a piece of sandpaper. There are, no features, there are no features, apart from when you see the MSR's main supply groups and things. Um, the GPS did drop out a couple of times, which is an oh, shit moment, but anyway, because um, but, but it, it kind of held up. The next thing I remember is... Um, there's a big, two big lakes outside Baghdad on um, on the, the south uh, western side, and we were going to go around the top uh, and across um, the, the northern lake. Um, but as we came um, over the top of the lake, uh, there was a road, and obviously, like, so there's a road just going around the edge of the lake. You just need to be careful for um, enemy vehicles. And as, as we went past about thirty feet, I just remember seeing one truck go like that, and the other truck go like that. And the uh, little master went up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we then went across the lake and we were supposed to be in radio silence. And uh, uh, and I heard from Ian said, up a bit. And found out later we were, we were so low that we were kicking up spray off the lake and it was hitting his windscreen. So he was flying at night, I think, if he was windscreen wipers. <laughs> um, and you'll see a picture later I've got of Afghanistan. And you'll see the vision, light vision goggles. The, 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 in those days, we didn't have very good formation lights. So we'd just fly on the globe from the power turbines out the back of the engines. So you were about 20 degrees off. Um, and then um, we uh, start slowing down and uh, doing the, from the initial point to the target. And sure enough, as I rolled out in finals with a quarter of a mile to go, and you couldn't see very far, far 30 feet, I just saw in the distance this white board. So, but really is here, because we'd seen it on satellite imagery and that's a, from a few days before. And then, of course, the next thing is a, is a, is a two ship night desert landing. So, zero speeds. That's what you're doing, because the, you'll see again the, the video I've got. You, in a Chinook, it's a 25-ton helicopter. It's got 80 mile an hour winds, and you start to kick up the dust from, a, from about 20 feet to the point where as the back wheels touch, you can't see anything. It just goes. Um, and at night, you get a sparkle effect off the blades as well, so the goggles just shut down. So you literally put it down. And so we, we landed. I pulled um, uh, the throttles back, uh, and we shut the, both the aircraft down. For 94 minutes. Oof. Oh. Well, supposed to be two hours. Uh, and then I just watching the distance as all this traffic's driving around the equivalent of the, uh, the Baghdad M25. One of the things that uh, I'd been asked is, is there anything that you like? I said, yeah, I'd like the mother of all their weights to take place around about the time that we're going in, and preferably not on top of me. So they gave us um, uh, a 500 meter corridor to go down. I said, this is where we're going in. Which was a which was a no um, a no strike zone, and then sure enough, just as we we're just as we we're touching down, this massive air raid started up, um, and you could just all around you. And then I looked, and there was a, an anti aircraft gun, a ZSU twenty three four, which is pretty lethal. It was two hundred meters away from the aircraft, which we didn't know about. And I was watching the Iraqis reload this thing. They were kind of walking on. Um, anyway, the troops got out um, and uh, dug the two trenches. Uh, uh, and pull the fiber optic out. Um, 
and they put 700 pounds of plastic explosives into each one. They didn't tell me after, well, they did tell me just before, they had a, the, the longest, the longest detonator they could find was four minutes, 20 seconds. <laughs> what? Couldn't you give me 20 minutes or something? No, no, all we've got is four minutes. It's all we've got with us, boss. Great. Uh, didn't think we were going to do it. Yeah, good. All right. So anyway, um, we they all patrolled back in, came up to, there was just two guys left, the two Dems guys, who were going to go click, click, and then run the 20 metres towards the airport. So I was pushing the throttles forward because these two guys leapt through the door. And then we took off. And I, th I think uh, one of the crew said, okay, game on now, because they know we're here. And then uh, uh, he was, the, the Dems guy was counting down on his watch. And he went, and I remember as we came back out across the lake, Graham um, was my crew, who was sadly killed on the Mullican Tower a few years later. Went um, 30 seconds, 15, 10, 3, 2, 1, nothing. And then this almighty flash from behind the aircraft as they both went off. On the way out, uh, I had three missile engagements. I had an SA-8 go over the top of the aircraft because they knew we were there. Um, uh, Misophonian had to go and hide. We'd run out of countermeasures at one point. We had to go and hide in a wadi as these missiles were going from then hover taxi in different directions out. Um, uh, uh, so wadi is a valley, a, valley, a desert valley where the streams run through about 20 or 30 foot. So once we got, you know, you've, you've seen Top Gun, you know, mm -hmm. ning, 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 ning. that means the missile's locked you, and then about a second later it's coming for you. And I must have heard that about seven or eight times that night on the way out. Uh, uh, and what you do is you, there are a load, of, a load of tactics you do in terms of trying to break the block through the, the countermeasures out, combination two, go for that ground. Then eight times it, it worked, and then I ran out of countermeasures. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we went and hit the wadi, and then just hover taxied away until we we're far enough away to be outside the missile engagement zone, and then carried on. We then kind of, as we uh, got across, the most actually, but where we got the most contacts, the most enemy interaction was was right up against the side of the Saudi border because they were just camped along there. Um, and uh, so we were, you know, you think you're home and dry, and just the point you think you're home and dry, actually, you've got to be really careful because that's the point where um, where, where most of the enemy interaction would take place. But I remember as we um, as we uh, uh, kind of came back in Saudi Arabia and we started climbing up to a couple of thousand feet and we checked in with AWACS uh, who were monitoring us. Uh, uh, and I can remember, because my mi you know, mission number 40174018, we are feet dry. And here's the really weird thing, code, code, the code word that we were given for mission complete was Geronimo. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen Zero Dark Thirty? Mm -hmm. It's the same code word. When I read it, when I heard Zero Dark Thirty, I mean, who's giving these code words out, you know? Shop bin Laden, and we do this thing. So anyway, mm. so we went Geronimo, and they said confirm, and we authenticated. Um, and then we landed back at Al Chief. I was like, so shattered. Uh, the ground crew had to lift me out of the seat. I was that tired. I'd been on the seat for nine hours by then, at twenty or thirty feet, I'm all forty knots. You just with with two kilograms on the front of your head on your helmet, which is the night vision goggles with a forty degree field of view. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so, um, and that picture there, you can see, so that's not my crew, that's uh, that's Ian's crew. So that was taken just after we landed. Um, but uh, the fibre optic cable um, was then put on a, um, part of it was then put on a, no, the board was then put on an American um, C-141 Starlift and flown direct to DC. Uh, and the Israeli ambassador was called in, in the early hours of the morning to see President Bush. Yeah. There you go. But special forces did it 12 hours ago hmm. and uh, i think mossad went okay that's okay let's see but what it allowed then there were no uh, scuds fired at uh, tel aviv for six days which uh gave the americans time to get the patriots in kept israel out of the war coalition carried on and that sort of thing hmm. the kind of real weird cross he took was about 10 years ago uh, i was with my eldest son who is mad for military history and we went into the imperial war museum and they had this special forces, special ops, SOE type thing. And he wandered off. I was looking someone, and there was, Dad, yeah, they've got your cable down here. No. Part of the cable was in the Imperial War. Huh. Yeah. So, so that was Gulf War One, one of the missions. I, flew, I think I flew about 20 missions altogether, but that was the most exciting one. That's how you get a distinguished flying cross. Hmm. Anyway, um, a bit of career chronology then, because I said for you. So, um, I went solo in a glider when I was 16 years old. And that was in October 1980. So I was aviation mad from a very early age. My dad flew, my dad was a flight engineer. 
Um, so I was just surrounded by airplanes and just kind of captivated by the whole thing. I was really lucky. I got a PPL Air Cadet Flying Scholarship in July 1983, so I got my PPL then. Um, I was checking this morning that uh, about two years ago, I was clearing, I was organising all my logbooks and things like that in my kind of den at home. And I thought, I wonder how many hours I did before I went solo on a Cessna 152. 4.7 hours. Yeah. <laughs> Mad. Who ever sent me solo? It's looking up. There we go. But there we are. Um, but I have been so in a, in a, in a glider. Um, I joined the RAF in 1984 at the age of uh, 19. Um, and I went through training. Uh, I, was, I was streamed, selected to go down the fast jet route, the fighter route. But I developed an air sickness problem high on set G. Watch Top Gun, pull a lot of G. Mm -hmm. I'd vomit at that point. Um, so it, it, when it was the high on it, it was snap G. That I'd do a bit of that. And I felt really sick really quickly. Interesting enough now, I mean, I've flown with the Red Arrows probably nine or six, nine or 10 times. Um, I've flown in lots of fast jets. Um, I wouldn't say I feel brilliant afterwards, but it, it doesn't have the same effect on me. Um, the kit is different as well. But I went through down the helicopter route then, and uh, I was posted to Seven Squadron. Um, it's the first ever ab initio. So first ever first tourist to go there. I, I was desperate not to fly the Chinook. I wanted to go and fly Wessex in Hong Kong or Cyprus. Why wouldn't you when you're 20 years old or whatever it is? Or even Northern Ireland, because you'd get a bit of excitement. But now, and what I didn't realize is that, uh, so I arrived on the squadron, and the week after um, I'd arrived, the squadron commander called me in for the arrival interview and said, How do you feel about getting special forces, Sean? Said, well, yes, sir, I worked really hard in three or four years' time, you know, if I've done okay. Then he said, No, Monday. <laughs> um, so that was, that was that. And I stayed there for eight years. Um, I did my instructor's course in 1992, and I went straight back um, to Seven Squadron. Uh, I then got promoted and I went to 18 Squadron, which is based in Germany uh, in 2004, dominated by Bosnia. And I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. Um, uh, I then went uh, back into the into the Special Forces as well, did some, some ground jobs there and then um, became a Chinook Squadron Commander, 27 Squadron in 2000, um, involved in Kosovo, Bosnia and Iraq. Got some stories, a couple of stories about that as well. Uh, there was then the Station Commander RF Odium uh, in 2005. Uh, we were involved in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Northern Ireland, Beirut, foot and mouth, flooding, a bunch of other things. You know. uh, I was then a Greek commander. Um, uh, so the RF uh, was in those days, is kind of, but they've changed it a little bit, split into three groups. One group um, does fast jets and, and uh, reconnaissance aircraft. Two group, all the big stuff. So helicopters, uh, the, air, the airline, search and rescue in those days before we civilianized it. And, Coast Guard took it on and also force protection. So RAF regiment, RAF police. And then my last job in the Air Force, I was the deputy chief of the Air Force in 2016. Um, so that's kind of my career chronology, mainly around the flying stuff. I did six years of purgatory in the Ministry of Defense. Apart from that. <laughs> yeah, there we are. So um, story about Seven Squadron. So when I was an instructor, and this is keep your wheels on your wagon, um, that's a uh, landing on HMS Illustrious for an exercise. Uh, I'm, I'm the one at the back. I was, I was the most junior. I'm flying number four. So I, and you land on the back of an aircraft carrier. It's where all the turbulence is. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah, it's all the rest of them are kind of right at the front. It was easy, right at the back, sort of Buckley Island. A little bit too. But the wheels on the wagon thing was I was on a, an Exxon's in Oman. Um, I've been an instructor for about a year, 18 months. And um, uh, we were cycling uh, pilots through, getting requalified in the desert by day and night. Uh, and also the loadmasters. So in the space of about three hours, you could give each of them 45 minutes in the seat, then, then you'd land, crew change, everyone climb into um, the right-hand seat, get their 30 minutes of kind of desert landings, tip, and then they're, you know, they're licensed to go off on their own. So I was doing the last one, being a, um, quite a nice night, and, and it was very sanitized. So we'd mark out a flat area that we'd looked at by day and done it by day, and we'd put these chem sticks down, silums, and they just land to the silums the whole time. So I was landing on an area about half the size of a football court or a football um, pitch. Anyway, on the last one, just about. So that last one, make it a good one. Then we'll head back. Had about 50 minutes of fuel. We were doing it in a place um, just up on the top of the Jebel uh, from Salala in southern Oman, uh, just south of another military airfield called Thumrate. And um, as we touched, all the aircraft do something funny. And of course, like a good instructor, I had my hand on the collective. So I just went like that. And we came back into high hold. One of the loadmasters, the loadmaster instructor went, so, Sean, the back right wheel doesn't seem to be hanging correctly. Oh, God. 
you know, what do you mean not hanging? So I don't know, but it's just not. So recycle, because the back right wheel is where the steering mechanism on the ground is. So you recycle that. And I recycle the uh, power steering and it clicked back in, I think. Well, maybe the steering's just become unlocked and it just needs to be set in. But it was a bit worse than that. So we, I said, right, well, let's go back to um, Salala. We flew back to Salala. Um, it's about 10 o'clock at night now, because uh, it's all at night. Um, and uh, we come to a hover. And uh, I said, get the ground crew to have a look before I land. So they open, in the hover, they open up the panel, showing the torch on. And uh, yeah, it's fine. It's a normal this storm. It must have been. So I land and the whole, the whole of the rear right wheel collapses on me. Just And what happened, there was a pin. There's like an A-frame assembly that goes in, which has uh, got a drag strut on it. And uh, the, the bullet had sheared and come out. And it was just offset slightly. When I landed, it pinched a hole in the side of the back of the aircraft. Hmm. And of course, things just dangling. Yeah. So um, it's 10 o'clock at night. I've got 30 minutes of fuel. The refuel has gone home. We've got a lot of sand, but no sandbags to land this thing on. So I uh, got all of the supernumerary crew off. So it's just me on my own in the aircraft with the load master instructor on a, on a long lead talking to me outside. And he said, he said uh, and what the uh, ground crew were then doing was trying to build a kind of crate uh, nets and boxes right. and stuff that I could just put the back of the aircraft into. But it's 35 degrees and there's no air conditioning and I'm on goggles as well. I'm thinking, why me? Um, and uh, uh, Will goes to me as the crewman says, why don't we just have a girl landing on a jack? Got nothing else to do for 10 minutes while they sort this out. I'm trying to visualize what an aircraft jack looks like. And I went, and I was so kind of tired. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but, but what an aircraft jack is. So the jacking point is like an egg that comes down on the bottom of the aircraft and goes into an egg cup. <laughs> and that's how they jack it up. I couldn't visualize this. I walked past aircrafts hundreds of times on jacks in the hangar, but never really visualized it. So anyway, um, they, they go and measure the jack. These grand crew aren't doing anything else apart from building me a crate. Um, next to the other aircraft, there are two other aircrafts. Um, yeah, around about that. So they wheel it back. And then uh, Will goes, right. Um, You're just sitting in the hover. I'm sitting in the hover, yeah. And I'm in the left-hand seat, sitting in the hover. And Will goes, right, uh, back five, four, three, two, one, steady. Down, three, two, one, steady. Right, units are now in inches. Normally they're in feet. He went, right three. And I thought, rather than go right three, I'll just squeeze the left pedal, because, of course, the back of the aircraft's 80 feet behind you. You squeeze, yep, steady. And then uh, in the Chinook, the pedal's trim. So he's pressed the button and the pedals, there's a heading hole. Just uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, right, um, down 10 inches, down five, four and right, three, two, one. Excuse my French. You've done it. And, went, <laughs> and, and then he went, oh shit. I said, what's it? He said, the other, I said, we're, we're not down. He said, yeah, the other three wheels are still flying. <laughs> he said, so the ground crew, they locked it, they put the brake on it, and the ground crew said, don't touch anything, don't draw them not to. And they wound the jack down. And well, took, rest well, yeah, it. and I just <laughs> take a little bit of power off until the other three wheels touched. Um, and then they kind of got, we got full weight on wheels. And he said, right, okay, quickly shut the aircraft down before it moves. So we shut the aircraft down and, and, uh, and just, I said, pull it away. And of course, like most of put the other red brake, he went, stop! I went, what? I said, don't put the right brake on because you get a torsional effect on the aircraft. It was a really good call, otherwise the thing with a skip can come out. Hmm. And uh, anyway, by that time, my squadron commander had been summoned from the hotel bar to come and um, have a look at this. And uh, as I got out, absolutely drenched, he, uh, he said, uh, bet you can do that again. I went, mm -hmm. bet you're right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, that, and that was that. And he said, and he goes, I was going to give you this later on the bar, but I'll give it to you now. And it was the letter saying you're promoted to squadron. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Great. So that was uh, another kind of but a, a training type um, story. I mean, the recollection of that was the crew cooperation between Will and everyone else involved in it, you know, on different leads to get us to the point where we could effectively. The trouble with Chinook is, if you don't have it absolutely level when you shut it down, with those two rotors, they, it'll, it'll thrash itself to bits. The droop, it has got droop stops on it, but it doesn't take much to throw the droop stops out, and you can have the, the one of, the, one of the, the blades sail through the, the back of the fuselage. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, one of my instructional uh, Tales. Um, Bosnia 95. Um, again, we went at, I was I was in Germany by this stage. 
got 24 hours notice to pack my kit, take my helmet, got on a C-130 and I arrived at Split Airport um, and then all the rest of the aircraft. The Dayton Peace Agreement had been signed about 10 days beforehand, so we went there under UN with UN berets and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and that there is a, is a painting that sits in the officer's mess at, um, at RAF Odium. I've got the original, actually, uh, the picture that was taken. That's a place called McConnich Grad, which uh, then, which was um, late December '95. That had been a town of eight thousand people until it was ethnically cleansed, and then they reckon there were one hundred and sixty left. So it was a ghost town, but we were based out of there with an army unit to, as a forward operating base. Um, I was thinking about you know I had a number of stories to tell, but one of the stories which is interesting was. Um, New Year's Eve of 95. We had one aircraft on an unofficial standby, mainly to do casualty evacuation if anyone got hurt. You know, we were still getting our feet under the table. The army was still kind of um, feeling their way into bits of Bosnia we hadn't been into before. Um, and I said, right, my crew, being you know, a bit of leadership, my crew on standby tonight, everybody else been working really hard for 10 days. Um, we're not going to start flying until midday tomorrow. We're going to have a few beers. It's New Year's Eve. Two o'clock in the morning, my phone goes. We need the aircraft to stand by. And what happened was uh, the Bosnian Serbs based in Banja Luka, that's where they were based. Um, some other Bosnian Serbs just outside Sarajevo had taken a load of uh, Bosniaks, uh, who are Bosnian Muslims, hostage. And the whole Dayton peace agreement looked like it could unravel really quickly. So my task was to go to Sarajevo, pick up um, the UN High Commissioner called Carl Bildt, who had been the Prime Minister of Norway before that, um, and take him to Banja Luka for a meeting to try and negotiate things. So I took a phone call and said, oh, Banja Luka, we're not in Banja, we're not in Banja Luka, we're not near Banja Luka, we're not going that far, because Banja Luka is at the top end of Bosnia. We were kind of exploiting from the south. It was deepest, darkest Serb territory. And uh, the divisional liaison officer said, uh, yeah, some of us are. And I went, really? Who? said, you might know them from your former job, Sean. Oh, that'll be the SAS then. So we had special forces up in Banja Luka, but, but no one else. And I said, well, where am, I, where am I going? He said, well, here's a grid reference. So we quickly plotted it on these maps, which were a bit out of date. And I, and I went, I looked at, that's the football stadium. He went, yeah, that's where you're being dropped. That's the most secure area they can find. And that's the area they think they can secure. For you. So we get into Sarajevo. One thing I remember about going to Sarajevo is the weather was awful. It was honking with snow. So I flew uh, an instrument approach in the Sarajevo down what's known as the Kisilyak Valley. Um, and it was about six in the morning, it was still dark. Um, and uh, with a French, it was a French talk down because the instrument landing system was on the blink. So getting getting a, a radar talk down from a French air traffic controller is interesting at the best of times. But um, anyway, it was kind of pigeon. Luckily, my co pilot spoke a bit of French, so it was okay. But anyways, we were going down the Kisilyak Valley. You know, here's a bit of ground school for you. You know, you've got high mountains either side, Mount Egmont. And of course, what happens to air when it cools on the top of mountains? Descends. Descends, yeah. It's called catabatic drainage. So I was coming down this thing at about this approach, about plus two, plus three degrees, snow. And then, of course, every thousand foot of the descent and on the approach, you do an icing check, you call the outside air temperature, and you look at the snow. Uh, and Duncan, who's a, a co pilot, said, Oh, uh, yeah, uh, approaching a thousand foot. And then he just put his hand over the outside air temperature, goes, Well, what? I went, Nothing. We'll talk about it on the ground. It gone to minus 18 from plus two. And just like this cold area sunk. And of course, all of a sudden, you, I could just see ice crystals graying around the cockpit. Now, the Chinook with those blades just eats it up. The biggest problem with the Chinook is not that the blades will last. I mean, you can hear the, the ice that sheds hitting the side of the aircraft. It's not doing a huge amount of damage. Is the droop stops. Because if the droop stops ice, ice out, and when they shut down, there's got nothing because they're, they're centrifugal droop stops. They're not like most ones which um, you have the, the ring. These things are, these are centrifugal. Um, so that was my biggest way, actually. We weren't going to shut down. But when we landed on the runway and the, 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 the runway fixing went operating because the runway was just covered in snow. So we, we landed on the runway, and again, like desert, but white at this stage. We were on the ground and, and I looked and the red out was zero and we weren't moving. And I looked at the windscreen and it was still kind of white. And I said to the lead master, I said, are we down? He went, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror and he had the ramp down. And it was clear like that. And then gradually, where all the anti icing went, just started to melt. It's the windscreen anti icing started to melt all this stuff off. They drove Carl Bill out in a in a, a skidoo, 
when we got on the back of the aircraft, we took off. And then we had to go VFR. It was getting light by then, valley hopping, the letterboxing, as they're called. You see this little gap that goes through it. Uh, he was sat in the jump set. I think he enjoyed the trip. I'm not sure I did, usually. But anyway, um, we, we get to the top of the Bani Luka Bowl, and the Bani Luka was clear. Uh, and it, it can get a bit foggy in there. But um, right in the middle of Bani Luka, where the sports stadium was, the football stadium was clear. So I'm, I'm skeptical of it, but that being wrong. So I look, go over the top, call on the frequency, and they come, yeah, Roger, you're clear in. And I look down, and there's this little orange cross that they put out on the centre spot. So we landed. Uh, and these dudes come and said, right, we're going up the top of that hill over there. And one of them watched us, oh, boss, hello again. Another we meet in. Um, we're going up there. And uh, I said, when do you want us back to? Now, you've got to stay here with the signal. If it all goes to ratchet, you'll come and get us quickly. Particularly, we've got to fight our way out of it. Yeah, even better. So we, we're in this sports stadium with two signalers. And I said, who's going to provide protection for their cross here? You got a gun on you. <laughs> we did. Um, but what I didn't realize is that on New Year's Day in uh, Bani Luka, they have a big market and everyone's coming in for this kind of New Year's market. And it turned into your worst air show nightmare because everybody had seen the aircraft come in and all wanted to go and have a look. Everyone turned low. Um, the one good thing is we had Union Jacks painting on the back of the aircraft. And of course, the Serbs were very pro Brit. Um, so from the Second World War. So they were very, for some reason, very pro-Brit. Um, but it was very cold uh, and we were on the ground for about six hours so they wouldn't do the thing before we went and extracted them. But because it was really cold, every couple of hours you need to start the aircraft up to stop it cold soaking. Um, and the battery in the Chinook is tiny because uh, it starts on the hydraulic power, but it does need a little spark to get it going. So we, every time we fired it up, we'd take the battery out and one of us would cuddle the battery. Yeah, cuddle the battery. Yeah. That, was our, that was our get out of jail free thing, was cuddling this battery. So we took it in turns to have this battery. But the other thing I remember is a tap on my shoulder. Well, no, we were having snowball fights, yeah. And we were having snowball fights with kids. Everybody carried a weapon. Everyone had an AK-47. So you're thinking, I'm having a snowball fight with a teenager here. And if I get him in the eye, he might shoot back at me. Don't really but I want to play snowball fights and have a look at the aircraft. And then I got um, a tap on my shoulder. I turned around and there was this very, very attractive kind of 19, 20 year old young lady with an AK-47 slung across her chest. And she said, hello, can I practice my English on you? And I went, yeah, sure. Well, I could say no. Um, I said, so where, where did you learn English? She said, oh, until a month ago, I was an au pair in Surbiton. I said, hang on, you're an au pair in Surbiton. So yes, yeah, so what are you doing here? I said, oh, well, when the, when the Croat forces got within uh, 10 kilometers of my village, my father rang me up and said, I need to come back and fight. So I said, how did you get here? I said, well, I got the train to Belgrade and then I got a bus and I did this and did that. And I said, did you have to fight? I said, no, they got to within three kilometres and then it stopped. So, yeah. mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, Pell Bill did his, uh, did what worked his magic. We averted um, the end of the, uh, the Dayton agreement. Um, but it just goes as a, as a helicopter operator. You know, it's not, not all just you know, low and fast and tactical. Some of it is just taxi flying, but very important taxi flying. A couple more. Um, Afghanistan, 2002. Uh, I was Chinook Squadron Commander. We went out there searching for Bin Laden. He had gone. Um, uh, that's a picture of me. Uh, that's actually in 2006, actually, a place called Fort Rob. Um, there's another slug load just underneath that. Um, uh, dusty. About five seconds later, you couldn't see anything because it just en enveloped the whole thing. But um, but. We'd been there about three months. So we went there in January. And, and when we arrived in January, so I, I was on in Norway doing our winter kind of uh, uh, snow flying exercise. And I got a phone call saying, you need to come back now. The squadron, they can pack up, come back as well. Uh, where we, I said, where are you going? Went, Afghanistan. Went, okay. Um, 48 hours later, I was at, uh, at Bagram Air Base. Um, three of my aircraft were on an aircraft carriage just sat off the coast of Pakistan. Uh, they flew up through Pakistan. Afghanistan up to Bagram, eight hour trip. And the other three aircraft came in on, uh, on Antonov 124s and, and a C 17, I think. So within about a couple of weeks, we had all the aircraft built up. Uh, four, five commando and three commando brigade uh, were the allocated British forces to go into the mountains. I mean, if you read the history of the thing, it was that the Americans, Operation Anaconda, had, a, had a, got bumped very badly by the remnants of Al Qaeda on top of the mountain. And they, um, there, were, there were three Medal of Honor winners off the top of that, a couple of seals as well. So, I mean, you read the history of that. It's in a place called the Shaikov Valley. Um, anyway, we were exploiting up into the mountains uh, about two months after that. 
And uh, we go, Judy goes a pair with, uh, uh, I was flying as number two actually, my deputy um, squadron commander was, was leading. Um, and we had a uh, 200 slung load, so I had these all-terrain vehicles underneath. 10 of their recon uh, horses um, and a load of ammunition and stuff like that. Um, we tried to get in to uh, these two mountain pinnacles at about 12,000 feet above sea level um, at last light, but massive thunderstorms, big electrical storms. So we went back to our forward operating base about 30 miles away and just sat on the ground and waited until uh, they had dissipated. And then we, we fired up and we went back in again. As we uh, went through the IP, we split. So I could see where my um, landing point was, and it was just starting to get light at this point. Um, and uh, talking um, to Johnny afterwards, he said, as we went through the IP, he almost lost control of the aircraft. Massive uh, wind shear. And then it all went smooth. And I said, well, nice if you called it, mate. He said, why is it? Because what happened to me after about uh, two minutes later. So we were on the approach to, to the top of this uh, uh, mountain pinnacle, half on goggles, half off. We'd done a lot of reconnaissance on, on satellite imagery to see where it was. And actually, when I first learned to mountain fly, I was taught by a search and rescue pilot. I said, Sean, there's only two things you need to know in the mountains. One's where the wind's coming in and two, where's your escape route? Because if the wind goes horribly wrong on you, at least you've got a flyway option. So we nominate an escape route. Um, uh, as we're going through about 60 feet, 70 feet on the approach, it felt like someone just slapped the aircraft down. And every time I pulled up the lever and the revs just went down. The point where, uh, as I was doing this, trying to arrest the rate of descent, uh, below 90% rotor bump in the Chinook, both the generators drop offline, which means that the uh, automatic plant control system goes. Uh, all the cannon measures go off, all the cockpit lights go off, um, and it all gets a bit interesting. Uh, and the controls uh, go start to get a bit sluggish because the hydraulics start to struggle a bit. Um, just as I shouted, jettison, Claire, who's my co pilot, was guarding the switch, banged load off which got rid of three tons underneath us but even so it felt like I was stirring porridge with a cyclic um and I started to go the um my crewman splash and all shout overshoot 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 and I think I scored I'm trying mm. so we picked like a fire break um to kind of go down as the overshoot um and I had two options one was to try and put it down in the clearing which was quite big but what I thought picked off the imagery as kind of small trees, about half the size of the ones on the other side of the airfield, were the ones the size of the other side of the airfield. So I thought, if we run into that, we'll just wreck the aircraft. And then there was a sheer drop down the other side into this valley. So started to go uh, for uh, the um, started to go for the uh, the kind of fire break. Um, and in the Puma in those days, they didn't have anticipators on the engines. And I'd been examining on the Puma about four years beforehand. And the drill there is you've got low rotor from it is take an inch off the lever and then take your hand off it. So you just give the engines back a bit and then just leave it alone. So I did that and then I just flip cyclically out. The trouble with the Schnuck is the cyclic is a differential collective because the way that you pitch is collective on the front disc versus the back disc. The pedals are cyclic. You're doing this with it. Get into that later if you want. So I was just gently going through like this. And as we went down um, uh, this fire break, Claire managed to get the auxiliary power unit up. She's got its own generator and its own hydraulic pump and tied them to the system. So they started to get more control back of the aircraft. But I could hear the trees hitting the bottom of the aircraft, which went down the side. And then uh, flew away and came back in, dropped the rest of the troops off. The rest of the troops are start as we as jets in the load, the rest of the troops start standing up to get off. So, um, but uh, yeah, when we got back uh, the, and they milked the flight data record, the, there was no damage to the aircraft at all, apart from the fact that the rotor RPM had gone really low. The rotor RPM had gone down to 82%. When the Boeing test pilot tried to replicate that in the simulator all the time, they just crashed because mm -hmm. it shouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. But it did, luckily. I think the lesson I had from that is a bit of experience, a bit of wisdom from teaching people how to do it in the Puma, a low rotor RPM recovery, having the escape route. Without that escape route, we would have just hit the trees. Um, and then having a crew that kind of took care of me by getting the APU back up really quickly, um, getting rid of the load really quickly as well. So actually all the drills that we practiced over and over and over again in the simulator just went bang, 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 bang. So part of it was training, 
but part of it is education. And, and what I say to people is you, you train for certainty, but you educate for uncertainty. So you train for things that you know are going to happen to you, but occasionally there'll be stuff that you don't know about. And that's where being curious comes in. That's by doing lots of different things, talking to people, reading about it, listening to, to stories and things like that. That's where the education comes in. And I used to think a combination of training and education to get out and used up another life. So that was overshoot, overshoot. Um, very last one, but one actually, um, mobile emergency response team, stuff you'll have seen on the news in Afghanistan a few years time, a few years ago. Um, my, my very last trip was a casualty evacuation where um, uh, we got called out. I didn't fly as captain by then uh, because I was a base commander. So I could fly the aircraft, I had 5,000 hours on the aircraft. So I knew how to fly the aircraft, but lots going on, lots of radios, lots of tactics, lots of procedures. Um, we did an evacuation at about two o'clock in the morning down near a place called Garmsir, which is a fish hook. Two soldiers had stood on IEDs, you know, massive detonation. Uh, multiple limb loss um, and that's who we went to extract they were still in our contact so as we were coming in the flare it's apache putting 30 mil down from 30 feet of the aircraft things exploding everywhere. got the casualties on board and we were just about to lift and the crewman said uh stand by lower in the ramp and there's there was uh, an afghan uh chap running towards the aircraft with, with what is, is his eight-year-old daughter who'd been caught in the blast Gets onto the back of the aircraft, um, and uh, as we were flying back to Baston, which is only about a 25 minute flight from there, the uh, crew were going faster, faster, um, and without getting too gory, they, they had to crack, crack her chest on the back of the aircraft because she was she had no output uh, at all. The two soldiers were stable, came whistling in, land on the pad, ambulances go, and then everything's gone, and you've gone from complete mayhem to nothing in about a second and a half. And you shut the aircraft down and as pilots you sat there in the front you don't see all the stuff and then you you get out of the back and it, it's look it looks like you know something off casualty you know with tubes and fluids and all sort of thing. so you clear the aircraft up go back to bed and what we would do is at eight o'clock in the morning we'd hand over to the oncoming crew and what we'd also do is we'd always go to the hospital to see how any of the patients that we may have extracted from the and uh, we walked in and uh, um, and there was a, a half colonel, a lieutenant colonel a nurse who runs the hospital. And you walk into a kind of a vestibule, which looks like, you know, uh, an ED department. And uh, I said, hi, she went, oh, hi, sir. You know, I said, how, um, how are the two soldiers doing? I said, yeah, they're stable. They're out of surgery. The C-17 is on its way. Uh, they'll be back in Birmingham by tomorrow. Okay. I said, shame about the little girl. And she went, what do you mean? Said, well, when we dropped off, there was no output. We thought she'd gone. Come with me. And uh, as we walked into the Afghan ward, this Afghan ward, theirs was this little girl sat up in bed, a lot of tubes going, eating chocolate. Mm -hmm. And her father, who was asleep in chairs, suddenly saw us come in. Of course, he saw the loadmaster who put the ramp down and dragged him on the back. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought it's not a bad way to fly your last operational trip in China. Mm -hmm. That is it. Yeah. And I think it's just you know, eight-year-old little girl. Well, they can take a lot of punishment. What they mm -hmm. found was when I got into theatre, a microscopic bleed uh, in one of her main arteries that they managed to repair. And when the nurse said to me, uh, you wouldn't get this care in the UK. If she was in the UK, she'd probably have died. But because you had so many trauma experts all in one place, all the specialists to come, she lived. Mind you, she mm -hmm. wouldn't have got blown up in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, Did that at the end, C-17. I saw C-17 go over the top earlier on. So I got a, a first pilot qualification in C-17 uh, when I was a Greek commander. Um, helicopter pilot running an airline it's an interesting concept mm -hmm. particularly as an accountable manager huh. I had a fixed wing license um, as Peter knows um, but uh, all the safety stuff how do you understand some of the safety implications of that um, and uh, so the advice to me from the station commander's advice was get, get qualified on cut the aircraft one was the Hercules which I did first and then the other one was C-17 amazing machine amazing machine um, at the end of my uh, the last uh, approach I flew on my kind of one and a half week course was like, we're going to do, we're going to do a tactical approach um, with a, the C-17 has got a blown wing. So when you put the flaps fully down, uh, the airflow goes over the top of the flaps as well. So the throttles, and the fixing points here, you blow the wings. So I think you just generate and lift over the wing of the throttles. Um, and the, uh, the control column then acts like a cyclic. So that's speed and that's rate of descent. Most fixed wing pilots, it's the other way around, blows their brains, particularly in jet things. So for a helicopter pilot, it's quite intuitive. 
And then you don't flare this at the bottom. You do a power push. See, it just rolls. Just go mm. the wing. So it's a bit like cushioning on the collective. Like cushioning on the collective. So yeah, I've got to fly that. I've got another story about that in Juba, but I've um, realised that I've been talking for almost an hour. Um, and then, best to last. <laughs> we talked about this the other day when we were down in Pudstow. Two years ago, I was on Married at First Sight. <laughs> and that was the couple. <laughs> who I did their first date two hours after they'd been married. So there we go. The lane's legs looking up. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have they? Yeah. Must have done to me. <laughs> the only thing was, is, bless them, as we, and it was at Channel 4, said, just fly them down the beach over ports and bring them back. And, but don't want to hear any of, the, any of the air traffic control or intercom. So could you make it? And I said, yeah, I can mute the, the radios and things, but I need to be able to talk to them and I need to be able to hear them. As we are going down the beach, it was, hey, babe, look, there's France. I went, no, that's the other one. <laughs> so I'm thinking... <laughs> And as we turn over Portsmouth, the other one said, babe, look, look at that massive aircraft carrier coming in. I'm thinking, no, that's one of the, no, look at that massive ferry coming in. Yeah. And I yeah. think, no, that's an aircraft carrier. <laughs> I'll probably stop there, because um, I've been talking for most of an hour. Um, questions? Questions? <laughs> Yeah. Not to put the rotor brake on, yeah. No, because um the rotor brake from the Schnuckers is, is uh brakes towards the the rear rotor. And what you can do, and it's only because load masters see it every day of the week. The back of the aircraft just does this. It just flexes a little bit because it, it, the torsional effect on the aircraft. And what he was worried about is, so I put the rotor brake on. You've got a bit of a torsional effect. It could jump out the jack. So, uh, so that's why he said, "Don't put the rotor brake." Any anybody online got a question for Sean? No. Who's that? So, oh, Sophie. Sophie? Did you say yeah. you had one, Sophie? Do, do I say what? Yeah, of course, right. you can answer any question. Huh? <laughs> you have a conversation in the background. <laughs> What's your favourite outside of gliding helicopter? Oh, that's a bit of a mean question for a ground school of helicopter pilots, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, it is helicopters. Yeah, it is helicopters. I think, uh, one, because that's what I've flown most of. And I've been re really lucky to fly all sorts of different times, from an R-22 to a Chinook. Yeah. And they're all different. Um, and on the fixing, I've flown everything from a C-17 to a Cessna 152 and glides as well. And I've got a share and a chipmunk. I think... The thing about helicopters is... Well, 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 so you've got a show and a chipmunk yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Why is that not here? <laughs> we're, we're all having to go. I'll bring it up. I'll bring it yeah, up. Definitely. I'll bring it up, yeah. Yeah, let's down at Odium. It's a glider type. Yeah, I'll bring it up one day. And we'll go, oh, that'd down. be brilliant. Yeah, I'll do yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Um, Pete will be first. And Q, won't you, to go to the chipmunk? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I think the thing with helicopters, it's... And gliding is a, probably a little bit of a close second. It's a very pure form of aviation. You don't need a runway. Um, you know, you can just pick up to the hover and you are flying straight away. Uh, you can go into places that um, aircraft just can't go. More than I talked about it earlier. I said, you know, if you want to go somewhere um, that's a long distance, go in an airplane. Yeah. Because it'll get you there a bit faster. And also, it's just not as fatiguing because you can just trim it out, kind of take your arms off and just watch the world go by. Whereas, of course, the helicopters, we all know you've got to fly it the whole time. <coughs> So I think helicopters, and of course, you've seen from some of those stories, you know, landing on aircraft carriers, landing in ships, going to confined areas, landing in the desert, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so yeah, helicopters are uh, still my full, favourite form of aviation. I love it all, I do, but, you know, and actually quite a lot. I like the, now I like the variety. So tomorrow I'm doing a bit of things we're instructing. It's just a bit different, you know, mm. and that, that's what makes it fun. But, you know, if someone said you only get to do one, it would be helicopters. The um, minimum crow for a Chinook. Could you mm -hmm. fly on your own? Well, I was once a 
as I said on my own, just with that that, that incident. And the reason we've got everyone else off is because it, if it did thrash itself to bits, then you know people were less likely to get hurt. Um, it's four crew normally, two pilots, two load masters. So uh, two pilots, of course, in the front. Um, we swap seats quite a lot, actually. So you don't have to be captain in the right-hand seat. Quite often, I'd fly in the left-hand seat as captain, mainly because all, the, all of the, the radios and all the mission computers are there. So if you're running the mission, the Schnook, the Schnook is easy to fly. It's easier than any of the helicopters. I've heard because right. you've got various abilities, et cetera. You've got the automatic flight control system, that gets a bit interesting. But with all of that in, it's very easy to fly. You don't use your feet. Imagine a helicopter, you don't use your feet. The only time you use your feet, of course, is if you do want to use it. But to lift off the hover things like that, you take your feet off the pedals. You see it's got it's it's just, like yeah, it just just sits there. So, so uh, we would swap seats uh, quite regularly. Um, and then in the back, you've got two load masters. Uh, what are load masters? So they, are, they run the cabin. Okay. They're the people you see them. I've got a video. Five ten minute video of Afghanistan, which I can share in a minute if you want. Yeah, uh, two thousand two, and you'll see the load masters there. They're on the weapons. They're loading the aircraft. More than that, and and uh, they're cabin crew effectively. But they're the people who talk you into confined areas. They're the people who talk you down, the wheels down, because they're leaning underneath the aircraft. They've got a far better view. And what's really sweet, actually, and, and it occurred probably after. I mean, we started it on Seven Squadron. Call it Total Crew Concept, which. In a really good working crew, all four of you would be talking to each other at the same time, but you wouldn't step on each other. You knew exactly who needed what information when to get the job done. Um, you know, we talk about it in human factors and CRM, that, that kind of that really effective communication. Quite often saying nothing is the best form of communication. And then when you do say something, it, it's really germane. Quite often when um, when the pressure goes up, people like to talk. Mm. And actually, really good crews are really quiet crews and they only talk when they need to. Uh, so this total crew, both the both the crewmen would carry a map as well. So even sitting sideways, some of them were better at navigating, looking sideways, than some of us were looking forwards, hmm. because they would they knew they only had one field of view. They were just going to, uh, 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 and they could tell whether you're on track, off track, even at 100 feet at night. They were just brilliant. They could navigate hmm. looking sideways, so, or so backwards. You fly on your own, but you're limited to what you can do if you're on your yeah, own. Yeah, and to work it hard. You needed all four of you because you could have up to 40 soldiers in the back, two vehicles, uh, quad bikes, uh, motorcycles, and then it's got three chinooks and uh, three, chinooks, three hooks underneath it. And quite often you'd use all three three hooks. Uh, the big hook is on the bottom, and there's a load hatch that the load master would lean underneath the aircraft and look at. And of course, the, the rear hook is 50 foot behind where you're sitting, and they're talking you back onto it, and they're facing backwards. I had a go once, blew my brain. You know, I used to sit forwards. Good, mm -hmm. good. But imagine, look, so you're upside down underneath, Going ma backwards. marshalling the pilot backwards. Um, you know, so, uh, and what they do is they would talk to each other all the time. So they'd help each other out all the time. But it was very, very precise uh, and very standardized. So very careful about using non standard language too. Because, you know, you don't move left. Do you want to go left? If all you heard was left. Yeah. Or move left. Or move left. So it would be, they would never say uh, you're drifting right. They would go steady left too. Things like that. So really careful because radio is going. If all you heard was left, then you go left. Yeah. So there's a shaft between the two called a synchronization shaft. So. There are eight mini shafts. So you know when you go and inspect on the 2244 in Canberra, you've got these flexi couplings. So there are eight flexi couplings going around the back because it goes like a banana in the middle. And they sit on these lord mounts. Um, so they are synchronized to stay apart. And in the hover, if you see the pictures of them, they sit above each other. In forward flight, they do overlap. When you really hear that real walk, 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 that's where they're in forward flight. The planes interlock. Yeah, the intermesh. Yeah. I was um, all the teams. With the Chinook um, South of Ireland dogs, which a couple of weeks ago, hey. and uh, we got held south side. And we did about four orbits, and I think I was a thousand feet. I can't believe how low they were. Uh, what in the, going down the hill? Yeah, they come from the west. Uh, they come from like along. Yeah, well, quite, to get to get from the base, which is Odium, yeah. and the, yeah. the conversion units at Benson as well. So you're over that way. A lot of the British Army live in East Anglia. 
Yeah, yeah. so they'd come and the quickest way through the West. Because yeah. 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 um, City were active, we got held um, south side of either dogs. So we were orbiting, and they were like, we'll be lonely. We're so, doing that. Just as well and then they shot that. off. Um, they were the same way as me, but I let them go first. So they went up. <laughs> and, uh, oh, they went up, you go. <laughs> through, uh, up through the reservoirs, and they were gone. They cruise wasn't any new rush though. <laughs> so they cruise at 140. Yeah, they're fast. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a few weeks ago. So we were talking about power curves and all that sort of stuff. The best cruising speed in the ship is 140. Yeah, they, they were gone. <laughs> Presumably because it's using so much fuel just to stay airborne. Yeah, and because turbines, you know, we draw, draw the power curve and also the max available turbines are different to piston. So you've got so much extra available to you. Um, and actually what turbines like to be have high power settings. So you want to be up around it above 85% and 90% because that's just when turbines are most efficient. You get too slow and the uh, yeah, you know, airflow coming through the turbine things like that. So they like to be going fast. What is their fuel consumption? Uh, so uh, um, <laughs> 1,200 kilos an hour, 1.2 tons an hour. They carry three tons. So you carry three tons. 1.2 tons, that's that, probably about. 15,000 litres yeah. an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so when we refuel, pressure refuel, um, there's, there's 250 litres a minute going in. So it's the same as an airliner, it's the same. So we see airliners being pressure refuel, it's 250 litres a minute. So that's a lot of fuel. It's a lot of fuel, mate. Chinook. So here we are. I, I, I thought we were going to get some tandem rotor theory yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. So, excuse my hands. If I was an RF bar and I took my hands out, I think I was a fighter pilot. But Chinook pilots have to do it to explain the rotors. So, you've got, so facing forward is two rotors. So cyclic that way and that way is differential collective. So you move the cyclic back, you put more collective pitch on the front and less on the back and vice versa. So that, that'll be it. To roll, they both do that. To your, Put the pedals in, so it's like a cyclic input. We'll do that. So one goes one 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 cyclic key goes one way, and the other one goes the other way, and you pivot around it. You should pivot around the centre of the car. That's always the interesting thing, actually, because we all revert to pivoting around ourselves, don't we? So when you when you do a spot turn in a light helicopter, even a forty four, which is a bit longer, you'll pivot around yourself, more or less. Yeah. More or less. So in a Chinook, you really have to force yourself that you're not pivoting here. You're actually moving sideways. It's like turning around the tail. Yeah. And, and but if you don't, if you just put the pedal in, um, then uh, it'll just do it anyway. It's now got a thing called a digital automatic flight control system in the Mark VI. And they did a, a demonstration for me, uh, they did it for Christmas last year, about a few years ago. So it's within its stabilization system, it's got a laser inertial nav system in it as well. Hmm. And if you press the button and say, Well, I want to hover in this point, uh, it will just keep you in the hover in that point. So so we, at Benson, we sat next to uh, one of the marker boards on the runway. We climbed to a thousand foot in a twenty-five knot wind. We did a three, and I had my hand off the cyclic. Did the did the spot turn, came back down again. It was exactly the same point. You can feel the aircraft moving around like that. So you just press the button. It was a stage. It's like some point on the ground. It? What's the point of that? Eh? Yeah, yeah, it's taking the fun out of it. <laughs> hey. Well, um, sorry, um, uh, I trained on the R twenty-two, I believe so, which I think. Was the area where they transported to the planes in the days of the British Navy? In those days, chicken walk was the final of actually everybody in the field. <clears throat> and the little boys and girls was hugely interesting. But the question I have is that have you spoken to some of the veterans from the Navy? I know it's a different year. Did they have the same? No, no, they didn't. No, they were opportunity to exchange those views over here. So uh, the the ones I got to know a little bit was um, when we came back from Gulf War One, we we struck up a a really close relationship with um, they were known as the uh, Task Force One Sixty then, but they became known as the One Sixty Special Operations Aviation Company. Um, Black Hawk Down, mm -hmm. that's the One Sixtieth. Uh, so I went over and I spent six weeks with them, and then they would uh, they spent their instructor pilot came back to see what happened. Um, I got to do air to air refueling. That's another story. Uh, I got to land in the water. That's another story as well. Um, got to fly the Black Hawk and the Hughes five hundred, the little bird as well. Um, 
a lot of a lot of the uh, older and bolder uh, Chinook pilots um, during uh, Gulf War One, and then shortly afterwards were Vietnam vets. Uh, and what they would say was a couple of things. Actually, one is um, they only had a simplex automatic flight control system, which was very rudiment rudimentary, so not nearly as stable as the aircraft is now. So I've had to fly a bit more like a helicopter. Um, the uh, they did a modification to the rotor systems after that, where the aircraft was set at eight degrees nose up in the hollow in Vietnam. And they changed the rigging of the aircraft significantly because if you sat eight degrees nose up, if you had three hooks, your back wheels would be on the ground before you could hook the load up. Um, so they had to level uh, the fuselage a bit more in the hover. Fundamentally, the cabin was the same. Um, the great thing about the Schnucker, you know, the cabin is just a box of empty metal. So it take a lot of damage. I've had, I've had my aircraft hit nine times and normally you've got a hole on one side and a hole on the other, which has gone straight out um, through. Uh, and it, so it's very battle tolerant. It's got two of everything, two hydraulic systems, two electrical systems, um, two uh, um, pedostatic systems. So it's got a lot of redundancy in it. Um, two rotors, yeah. Mm -hmm. And those big rotors can take a lot of damage, you know, um, particularly the ones now which are carbon fiber with titanium leading edges. So um, so their, their kind of view is, is, you know, if you want to go to war, strap yourself to a Chinook. They won't and, fly on one, right? One what? One, one black, one rotor. No, no, both rotors need to go. But they'll find yeah. it will still lift. Uh, those engines are mostly powerful. It'll still lift two and a half tons of payload on one engine. Amazing. Yeah, no, they were a lot younger. I think they they were. So some of these warrant officers were 18, 19, 20, 21 years old in Vietnam. I have. I was. I got qualified on that in my last couple of weeks of being a Greek commander. So the MSA 400 is a very, very capable aircraft. It's, a, it's the most powerful turboprop built in Western Europe. So there's a lot. There's a lot of kind of emotion about the C-130. My dad used to the C-130, the Hercules, and now it's just gone out of service. But the A400 will land on a shorter strip. It will take off on a shorter strip. It'll go further, faster. It's just a little bit unreliable, like a lot of new aircraft are when they come in. Although, if I'm being honest, it's taken longer than it should have done. The technology is stunning. It's got an Airbus A380 flight deck. Okay. It's exactly the same, but two extra tactical screens. It's got this huge wide angle head up display as well. You know, as well. Um, and just like most Airbus, it's designed to be easy to fly. Engineers have designed it to be. I mean, I could teach my mum to fly. I, my mum doesn't like flying. Uh, you just put the velocity vector on the runway. It's got an auto throttle. You dial up the speed you want on the approach. And at 30 feet, you stack two degrees nose up, and then it says retard, retard, and close the throttles. And it lands. Hmm. I mean, it is very, very, but it's designed um, not to be difficult to fly. It's designed to do a job. So I think in time, it'll be good. Um, it's still reliability. Yeah, it's, 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 those engines are still you know, on the edge of what is. Um, and engineering and science-wise, what's what's possible? So I think that's a bit of an issue. Um, uh, the other thing is because one of the problems we had on it is um, they call it parachutist crossover. So on the Hercules, all the engines go that way. On the A400, one side they go that way, and the other side they go that way. So they take out the torque effect. Uh, they, they both turn towards the fuselage. Yeah. So parachute is going outside the parachute doors either side. So on the Hercules, they will jump out. And there, there's a gap between them. What we got on the um, A400 was uh, that uh, the, the, the vortex has come off the wood basically underneath the aircraft, have a, an airflow that did that. Mm. So when they put the mannequin dummies out to begin with, the parachute, all the parachutes were hitting each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> they all jump at alternate times. No, yeah, alternate times, or they, they go off the ramp. Oh, just Goes straight off the run. That's uh, the easiest way to do it. So it was things like that that just caught people a bit by surprise. Um, I was the uh, I, I in the safety case when uh, some small uh, American actor called Tom Cruise wanted to <laughs> have a fight outside an Airbus A400. <laughs> so we had two or three meetings that he wanted to get. And have you, know, have you seen one of the Mission Impossible films mm -hmm. where he had all these wild ideas about what he wanted to do? So I said, well, first thing is, um, why don't you just do it over the top of an airfield? Okay, why? Well, he said, well, you're, you're, 
you're a skydiver, aren't you? So, yeah. But if we can't get you back in, what goes horribly wrong? I mean, you've got pressure on you. Hey, man, that's a great idea. I mean, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, um, and that was interesting because I said the airflow outside the aircraft and that side of the aircraft is really quite rough. Uh, and he got bashed around quite a lot in the airflow. I mean, it looks spectacular mm. if that's what you want to do. But um, yeah. Nice chat, Tom. Yay, good Tom. Do you want to have a quick look at a video then? Yeah. Oh, so I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> so this is a diagram in 2002. So spills the digital copy in 2002. Digital cameras are just in the GoPro would exist. So all I have got on camera is they kind of merge them all together. Then. So this is and by the matter. There's a mini gun. I'm going to be tested. He should test it in the range anyway. That's up on the mountain. It's going to be the Okay. Oh. 
that first thing kind of sort of the language that the language has to be acting with. So forty hooks forty foot behind you. So you're just listening to what they say. Hmm. Now there's a little bit here on night on night stuff, which is was taken through a night vision goggle, which just gives you an idea of, of what it, it looks like. What spinning music we done? What the goggles do is they're not so nice today, but they allow you to use gold paint So, enough of your hobby that you can keep doing the for years, but you still have them stand out in the way of the Two blokes on half dead, that's going to have to end themselves. Well, there's a really good view of the flow. Really hot to back in. There's the phosphorescent on the blade. Yeah. You see that? Massive up this one. That's a phosphorescent on the blade.
So I've got to make sure it's kind of a proper next year. There we go. Amazing. You're welcome. So the question I always get asked is, oh, what's your favourite helicopter? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I've got 5,000 hours on that one, so um, it's looked after me. So, How yeah. many total? Like, oh, well, total, total. Yeah. I've got about 7,500 rotary and I've got about 1,000 fixing. I think it's more than a bird. Yeah. yeah. Friends of mine have got more, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I went up the career path in the military, so I, there's kind of 10 years where I didn't do as much flying as friends of mine did. Um, so uh yeah i've got people who carried on flying in the air force and didn't go up the, up the career route um a lot more. did you learn in the r22 when you very very first started or did you go what was your first rotary helicopter gazelle first I presume the gazelle yeah. so imagine my surprise about seven years ago when i got into a piston engine helicopter <laughs> <laughs> what's this where's the rest of it where's the rest of it what was the, what was the first one you got into Piston. Oh well, so the very first one it was it was it was probably about twenty odd years ago, um, and I needed to go and pick up a jet engine, and uh, I got the I'll tell you what, we'll position you in an R twenty two, Sean. Uh, oh, it was an R twenty two. Yeah, and I I just spent a week flying a Chinook. <laughs> so you get yourself out of a hundred foot helicopter into this, and I climbed and went. What's the rest of it? Yeah, yeah. and I went. Where do I put my flight back? I went under your seat. I went what? All mm -hmm. oh, right, okay. Yeah, space, that'll <laughs> yeah. Do. yeah, so. And did, did it bother you? Uh, I, do you know what? I didn't feel that secure in it first time. I was just a bit, and then, but actually, when I saw the Cabri arrive, because so the Cabri is very similar to a Gazelle, it was a piston engine Gazelle. So, because uh, Gumball was on the design team for the Gazelle as well. So, the whole Fenestron, uh, three bladed, fully articulating wedge system, it, it, it feels the same. It kind of, you know, it's got that quite sturdy, very maneuverable, just like the Gazelle is as well. And with a lot of safety features that the gazelle's got as well. So, um, and, the, and, the, and of course, the, the, the slightly strange pedal um, ratios that you end up with a Fenestron aircraft rather than a, an all tail rotary aircraft, where, where most helicopter pilots find that really weird. I, I, most of us who learn on the gazelle find that quite normal because that's what we, that's what we first they used to bend linear output from, from, from the pedal input yeah. you know, on a tail rotor, whereas yeah. convention says a little bit like that. It's a dead spot kind of, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so that was okay. that was my first piston one, and actually, and then getting used to comfortable with piston, then the four, then I feel the forty four, um, and that, and I think you know the whole because I wasn't sure about the whole teeter bar and things like that, seemed a bit weird to me as well. But you get used to it, and the forty four actually, um, I feel that commercially for a year to try and build hours on it, because you can't instruct on the Robinson unless you've got fifty hours on it, and I'd never learn on the Robinson, so I needed to get fifty hours on it. So I flew it commercially for a year. Um, that was a good little aircraft flight. I mean, you. Knew, at the end of that, you realise why it's the most popular helicopter in the world. That's the funny thing, isn't it? So they won't let you teach somebody, but they'll let you fly it around commercially with people on board and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah try it out on them first. You know? yeah. <laughs> try it on the paying passengers. Yeah. Yeah. Funny yeah. Way. So for, for kind of sightseeing and pleasure yeah. flights, it's brilliant. You know, so it's well, so a popular helicopter still today. Yeah. It's outsold everything. It's incredible. Yeah. And then actually, the, the 22, no, I love it. It's a little go kart. You know, it's so pure. Um, so come on full circle. It's like all these things, isn't it? If you operate within the limits it's intended for, it's absolutely fine. Certainly when you push it beyond that, that it starts to take a few more chances and that is quite a bit great. So as, as my first helicopter instructor, no, I, when I was flying the Chinook actually, when I learned Chinook, my instructor was the Australian exchange pilot, a guy called Dean Watson. And we're all talking about how long it is. He went, mate, you only fly the first two feet, the rest of it comes with you. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a point. But you need to remember there's a hundred foot behind you. Okay? <laughs> but you don't, you sit in the front, don't you? Just the floor that's in front of you. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, it's trying not to fit what's back there. Yeah. 
So, oh. so, so is it Chinook then? Is your yeah, answer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you ever do anything with Apache? I've flown in Apache. I've had uh, two trips in Apache. Um, I have to say I don't find Apache very nice to fly, but it's not designed to be nice to fly. It's uh, designed to sit in a hover and shoot missiles. And that's what it says, set on the hover. It's like the Sea King. So when I, um, when I was running the sample, so I went and did a few trips to the Sea King. And the Sea King is really quite clunky, I found, and not very maneuverable. But in the hover, it's amazing. It's just rock solid. And yeah. you, can, you can hover it to within centimeters. You know, it's just really, you put it there and it just stays there. And then if you want to move somewhere, it's very precise. And that's what it was designed to do. It was designed to sit in the hover over the sea, normally with a sonar underneath looking for submarines. And then search and rescue. So it's designed to be a maritime helicopter. It wasn't designed to go, you know, so yeah, above 80 and 90 knots a second just shakes itself to bits. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. So often when we do trial lessons, you know, we, we, we have a go, don't know, we do our little bit and show our, how it can be flown nicely. And then sometimes the people say to us, oh yeah, and, and the search and rescue pilots, they're amazing at hovering, aren't they? Well, no, they just press a button and it just sits there. <laughs> how they can keep it so still. Yeah, I've just been working really hard to fly, really <laughs> well in an R22, you know. Yeah. If they get that a lot of them, they'll just have stabs. Well, I flame. So the Chinook, when it's light, so when it's got nothing inside it, is immensely overpowered. Um, and it is very, very maneuverable. You can, you know, you've seen the display. You've seen, so the, you've seen display. the display. Yeah. They just throw it around. Yeah, you can like really, when it's, when it's got, so when, the, when they're doing the display, um, they've only got 600 kilos of fuel, which sounds a lot, but that's half an hour's flying. So, so it's very light, not much fuel, and they can really throw it around. Um, the gazelle was good. The squirrel, actually, is surprising. Uh, does anyone know if they're going to be joining back or if they're having connection problems or? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Sean's um, just stopped my video. Sean's laptop just went flat. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Let me just, just bear with me. Let's have a look who's still online here. So I'll change my view and participants. Da -da -da -da. Right, you can hear me still, can't you? Yeah. Brilliant. Why can't I see everybody? Yeah, I'll bring you back now. Let's get back to the room. <laughs> We're still online. Sorry, I've got them. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, there's still a few people there. I was just telling a story about watching um, an MH53 do air to air fueling with a Hercules at under feet at night inside a rack. That hmm. was the most impressive bit of flying I've ever seen. But they, but they train for it all the time. They train for it day and night. And I presume that's the same with the Chinook or anything. The train, empty, loaded, 
So the, the controls must still. Yeah, no. So, so yeah. So you try. You try. You know, people talk about um, train hard, fight easy. Mm -hmm. So you try and push yourself in training as much as you can and make it as realistic as possible. I mean, a lot of it now is synthetics and flight simulators and things like that. So because the um, the synthetics are so good, and it's like your VR cabri simulator. You know, um, that is that they're that good that you can replicate quite a lot of it. But you can't. Um, it's very difficult to replicate the friction of the real world mm. where things just happen. Mm. Um, and that's where that education bit comes in. You know, you, the more you do that, the more you build your, your well of experience. Um, but oh, 10, 15 years ago, I was the personal aide to the person who ran the Air Force. And he had a phrase called phrenesis. Phrenesis is the Greek for practical wisdom. Mm. And he said, you know, uh, people who uh, do well in life have lots of phrenesis. They might be, they might be super smart. Uh, they might be super intelligent, lots, but, but actually that kind of practical wisdom, get stuff done kind of thing, you know, they just soak up all of this information. They just build, up, build their well of experience, which gives you that wisdom. Um, I'll go back to, you train for certainty. So, so when we, we're training you to fly a helicopter, we're, we're training you properly for certain things, you know, to fly circuit is. And that's why we're really careful about weather limits and things like that. So we keep you within a bounded bubble so that the training will work. When you go outside that bubble, you're getting into an area that you're not trained for. The way you push that is with somebody who's comfortable, like an instructor, to take you into that area and let you explore a bit. And that's how you build up that level of experience, that level of knowledge, um, that phrenesis, that wisdom, you know, which, which, which keeps you safe and stops you fighting yourself. Mm. Yeah. Indeed. Sean, you, you emphasize a lot in the articles. So, looking at the what if scenarios that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The RAF actually doing CRM way before. I did my first CRM course in 1985 when I went through training, and it was brand new then. So, I was one of the first courses to do it. I think. Um, the airlines have been doing it for about five or six years, maybe a bit longer, 10 years by then. Right. Um, but we got into it around about the time that, that all the major carriers got into it as well. Um, and at that point, it was cockpit resource management, just pilots. And then it became crew resource management. And then it became company resource management. <laughs> and actually, what's interesting now, and I'm, I um, did a top up the, the military human factors facilitators thing. Um, everybody everybody in who uh, is involved with flying and that's pretty much everyone in the air force has to do um half a day of human factors training every year and there's little things like it so even when you when you're getting on your airliner um the people who are on the gates now we're checking you in will know will be doing human factors training because they'll realize if you distract the flight crew at a critical point in time they might make a mistake or they might forget to do something so if you interrupt you got to a cockpit and you see the pilots are briefing, you don't interrupt them. You wait. Same same with a refueler who's refueling the aircraft. You wait. If someone's doing their walk round, you wait. A number of times I did walk round to other place and people go, Sean, 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 thinking, right. I'm actually doing a safety critical function here. I'm, I'm doing a check A on a, on a helicopter. And you come to interrupt me with some important to you, but actually, and probably quite important to whatever's going on, because it might be a change of plan or whatever. But if you then go back, so you always go back then. The rule mm. is you always go back three steps on what you're doing and then so you don't, you know, you don't miss anything. So, so that awareness, and if you look at the accident, the fact that anybody, um, and in the military, they talk about being in, in your mission bubble. So if a cruise in its mission bubble, uh, you, don't, you, don't, um, you don't puncture their mission bubble unless it's safety critical. So if you think something safety critical they need to know about, then you can puncture their bubble. Otherwise, you wait till afterwards. Um, so uh, that, that whole kind of awareness thing, I think, is really useful. Um, uh, and anyone who's involved in aviation you know, should do it. I was talking to Elaine about it the other day, actually. You know, maybe we should do a little bit uh, yeah. just just to give anybody who's involved in the operation a little bit of an insight into um, how people get distracted, how you can make mistakes. It's threat and error management, actually. Mm -hmm. It's what it's now been broken down into. You know, what are the threats? Are they external threats? Uh, are they internal threats? Uh, are they systemic threats? You know, just trying to think through those. Then errors are skill-based, knowledge-based, and violations. Most most errors actually that lead to an unsafe state 
are violations when people break the rules. Not deliberately. They get short of time, at corners, forget to do checks, don't follow processes, um, and then they get caught out. You know, oh, I've done this hundreds of times. It's a stupid joke. What am I doing? It? Mm -hmm. And then they get bitten. Yeah. So that that is why you know it's you know that's that's how you um, safety is safe systems will work. You have a safe system will work, and nine times out of ten that will take care of you. And the rest of it's education. Training is a safe system. People always um, seem surprised that I used to use a checklist instead of my PC. Yeah. And I, and I just religiously use a checklist. And everyone's, everyone else will fly with someone I haven't flown with before. It's like, hey, hey, you should use a checklist. I mean, yeah, I use a checklist. Because they assume time. you don't know what you're doing, don't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's really more the other way around, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because you do know what you're doing. Yeah. You use one. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, often, there's often schools of thought on it, isn't there? I mean... When you become an instructor, it's kind of expected that you shouldn't need to use one because you really ought to know what you're doing. But you know, we 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 still use them. Um, sometimes when you're reading them, we're actually reading it as well. But we've got the ability, hopefully, to pick up when you miss something. Well, hold on, that didn't sound right. And you hence you go back over, and that's what we've always taught you. So it's not doing them by rote. You've got to actually know what it is you're doing. Well, please, the check is to be won't tell you what to check but doesn't actually tell you where it is in the helicopter no that's right yeah and, and, the, and the check won't necessarily explain exactly why it is you're checking or why you're checking you would have to know that wouldn't you so it, it's really just a um it's an interesting point an like, about distractions though because you think about when we learn and you go down to the helipad yeah full of distractions oh absolutely there's always so much going on there yeah like people getting pulled away and other conversations coming in and it's and, hard. And, 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 and um it's not um You've got to be careful. So, so, so if you think you have been distracted, someone's interrupted with a safety critical process. Yeah. You know, there's no point getting cross about it. We're good as a okay, stop, and then just go back a few yeah. steps. It's not that sterile environment, really. Yeah, you do want it to be, is it? That's right. So you have to learn how to adapt to that. I see we were always taught, yeah, like Sean said, you you just go back if you if you. When you when you're when you starting up a helicopter and something's happened over there. And you suddenly come back into your checklist, say, just go back to a known point. But you, I definitely have done that part, and you can then move forward again, can't you? Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, no, hold on. That's, that's where I am. So you haven't missed that. But, I mean, every day, I mean, I uh, found more today um, explaining radio calls and getting pressure settings and things like that. And we got the QNH, and then they came back to me. And normally, I would be automatic set the QNH. And I looked down at something to go back to air traffic control and forgot to set the QNH. On the way out, I was climbing out and I did my freedom checks and I was thinking, oh, it doesn't look quite right. Here I'm going via alpha, altimeter, and slung QFE. It's, it's kind of reassuring to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, self, have the self discipline to do the yeah, checks, yeah. thought it because we were then going to climb up. Yeah. And um, not we wouldn't have got anywhere near infringing, but there could be places mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. here that you read 300 foot difference. Mm -hmm. I counted up the other day because some somebody that we, we teach. So it flew out and flew, flew a bit of a navigation on the QFE, uh, so, the, so the airfield setting. And I said, you do realise there's five opportunities where you could have caught that? And I said, what do you mean five? I said, there's five opportunities where you could have caught that. A, of course, when you're actually just preparing to, to get your thing going. But let's just say you decided to start off on QFE. On the climate, on the way up from the airfield, you're doing, you know, you're doing a free pass check, for instance, aren't you? And in there is A for altimeter, the setting. But what they've been doing is A for altitude. Am I at the right altitude? It's like, no, no. Have you got it set? That the thing you want to use to measure your altitude is entirely reliant upon you twiddling it, isn't it, and setting it. So you can't just read off of it. You've got to check, is it set? And so we went through this. Press five, yeah, five, there's a five occasions where they could have picked up on it. Because we every now and then do miss something. We say that discipline of doing those, for instance, airborne checks, you pick up on it. In the Chinooks, we still do a form of freedom checks. And it's challenging response. Clemens call it fuel, and you go through it. Radios, and but you've got six radios, then so you go through all the radios. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and uh, altimeter. There's two, al three altimeters set. You've got one on each side, and four, and two radar altimeters as well. So, and they want to know because it's their little pink bodies that you've got it all set correctly. Mm -hmm. And some of the checks are theirs, and we want to know that they've done theirs in the back, you know. So um particularly flying operationally because they control a lot of the countermeasures in the back. So those flares you saw go out mm -hmm. and that's all they they've got the very um some of the switchery down there. So you want to make sure front to back, left to right, everyone's on the same bit and you're looking after each other. Uh, and, met, and, and and if you have um that people make mistakes to, to make mistake as human, what you want to try and do is look after each other and pick them up so they don't become safety critical.
So, yeah. And the other thing is, is that, uh, you know, you're asking about training. So um, uh, we used to have very thorough debriefs. Um, so we would fly, you know, if you flew for three or four hours, you'd have a two hour debrief maybe. And what we tried to do is go through bit by bit. I mean, the first question was, did we achieve the mission? Yes, no. Like, okay, was it any, any, any threat in our management issue? So you go, do we recruit? It's a bit like it. Do we aim at the flight? Yes. We said we were going to learn to do this. Do we do that? Then any safety stuff. And then what we'd also do is we would um, focus on the positives first. What went well? What were we really pleased with? You know, what, what, so how can we do that again? How can we turn up the volume on that? How can we make it even better? And then you go, okay, so that went well. Where could we get better? So where, so it's a very positive way. Rather you did that wrong, you did that wrong. So on special forces, it was very much what went well, what could make us even better? And then the other bit is where do we need to improve? And then you then you go back to to achieve the mission, what we're good at. So you always leave on a positive, mm -hmm. and it's kind of that. But the um, uh, the red arrows use the same one, so I've flown with them. Um, so it's uh, as long as you keep TB positive and, and focus on the positives and where you can get even better, and then where the areas for improvement. So you call it a poop sandwich, don't we? Yeah. So start with a good bit, put the bad bit somewhere in the middle, and then end with a well. Well done, that was really good. Let's just say, let's see if we can improve on that. The Reds have something called re Reassure, which is a new one, because everyone's in the military. So R is, uh, is um, uh, a bit of relaxation and a bit of kind of, don't go into the debrief straight after the bang, you know, you're all hyped up. So uh, there's a bit of relationship rebuilding. And then um, E is elicit the aim. What, what was the mission? Did we do it? A, an assessment of what went well. Uh, and then a state of strengths. So there's only one S in it. U is understand the areas for improvement. R is restate the strengths. E is elicit, okay, well, what are we going to take away from this and do better? Mm -hmm. So the red arrows use that as their debriefing. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned that to you, Dylan, for yeah. I quite like that for flying instructors. So yeah. I use that um, when we do the flying sequels. Reassure. There's one S. There's one S. There's one S. Yeah. Uh, Stay relaxed, elicit the aim, assessment of what went well, state the strengths, understand the areas for improvement, restate the strengths, and then elicit what next. Pretty good. It's almost eight o'clock. I'll it? say any other final questions and we'll let um, everybody go then. Anybody online? They're very quiet. Good. They're all well, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I hope that's useful. That was really good. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, 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 thank you for your time. Mostly interesting. We've got some others, but not time. Not time. More stories. Thank you, everybody, for joining us online. And